Today I am joined by Dr. Michael Shermer, who is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, a monthly columnist for Scientific American, and a presidential fellow at Chapman University, where he teaches Skepticism 101, which the world needs a lot more of. He is also a New York Times best-selling author, his latest hit being Heavens on Earth, The Scientific Search for the Afterlife, Immortality, and Utopia. Thanks for taking the time today, Michael. Oh, it's great to be with your new podcast. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, so I thought we would um, start with how is the scientific search for an afterlife going? <laughs> well, uh, as you know, I'm a skeptic, so you, you might not be surprised to learn that. I, I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime, if ever. Um, but so there's a couple, couple of angles that I, I find interesting. The fact that we'd even be searching for it. Uh, not just through religion, which, of course, we, we, we all know about. It's been around for thousands of years, offering uh, various versions of the afterlife as something of a carrot and stick, a heaven and hell kind of thing. And so I do deal with the history of that. Um, but the book is really about uh, scientific attempts to achieve immortality. And, and I go through all the different scenarios, you know, the transhumanists and the extropians, they're against entropy, uh, the cryonics, people that want to freeze you and bring you back thousand years from now or whatever and and uh and especially interesting is the mind uploading uh, these this is the kind of the singularity is near ray kurzweil type scenarios in which um they scan a copy of scan and make a copy of your connectome the analog to your genome which is all the synaptic connections in your brain that represents your memories that are allegedly stored permanently uh, through these synaptic connections and then digitize the file it would be a huge file in fact as far as we know from the calculations of how big this file would be it would take up all, every all the computing power on the entire earth just for one brain so not likely any one person's going to even make it uh, anytime soon, if that's even you. So yeah. that's kind of the main focus of the book. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's interesting. About the computing power of the brain, I wonder if there's any way we're ever going to be able to harness that into an energy source. Is that something you've ever, uh, you've thought about much? Uh, well, I've, you know, read sci what are essentially sci-fi scenarios of, of that kind of thing. Uh, the problem is, um, is, 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 as marvelous as a computing device the human brain is, it doesn't generate much energy. Uh, you know, you, you're barely able to, to, to do the EEG readings, and, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a tiny amount. It's, it's not going to be useful for any kind of source of energy, but um, I, uh, I think what the idea of Connectome brings to mind are interesting philosophical problems, like the problem of identity. Who are you? Uh, you know, who are we individually? Um, and, you know, as you know, there's um, uh, qu quite a strong movement in philosophy and neuroscience that there is no you. The self is an illusion. There, there's no single, you know, module in the brain that, that the so-called self sits in uh, and coordinates all the, you know, the different um, inputs into, into a single unit. So, right. so what is your perspective on that? Uh, like what, uh, what side of the fence are you on when it comes to that? Well, I think I think the self is an illusion, although like free will, it's it's a it's a useful fiction. It's a great illusion. It works. I mean, it, it, essentially, I am a unit inside my skin and my brain inside my skull. That is me. You know, we are as you know, humans are not like a collective super organism, like a you know, like a tree root system or or social insects like bees. We're, we're not like that um, in terms of how we evolved. So so we are individuals. But. Um, but the neuroscientists who show that the brain is very modular, whether it's the Swiss Army knife uh, analog of the old uh, evolutionary psychologists or, or, or their new version, which is like a, an app, the apps on a phone. You know, there's just hundreds of different apps in the brain that does different things, facial recognition, language, um, you know, speech and visual perception and so on. There's hundreds and hundreds of these things operating you know, for the most part, independently of each other, and there's no that we know of, no like coordination module that puts it all together into a self. Well, yeah, I mean, when I when I think about um, just the basic things that we do as human beings, uh, and I try to boil it down to why we do those things, like what's driving us to to get up uh, in the morning, and it, and for me, it always just boils down to this um, pleasure drive that we seem to have. Uh, to move us um, from place to place, and and some of us um, 
you know, find a lot of pleasure in very simple things. And some of us are pleasure junkies where we're just jumping from maximal pleasure to maximal pleasure. Is, is, is pleasure the, the thing that drives us to make us to, to even move? Well, it would depend on what you mean by pleasure. I mean, I think most people think of that as just like the morphine drip or you, you, you're, you're on Oxycontin and, and just is flying through life before it all comes crashing down. Um, most people are not solely motivated by that kind of pleasure. Just, you know, it feels good. It makes me happy. It's fun uh, for the moment. Uh, but if you mean by pleasure, like uh, Bentham uh, kind of uh, refined his notion of you know the greatest happiness idea that that you know ha- being happy may be doing things that are not pleasurable in, in, immediately they're pleasurable down the road like you know reading a, a long book is going to take me days or weeks and it's a hard slog if it's a you know a, a difficult science book you know but in the end I I'm, I feel better at, at having accomplished it even though it wasn't fun along the way or you know working out is not fun, but I feel better. The pleasure comes later. It's more of a long-term investment. Right. Yeah. So I think if the, if the word is defined broadly enough, yes, I think that's a a major motivator. Right. And, and then, and so where does this idea and and maybe it's a false idea of consciousness come into this whole, um, whole discussion? Yeah. Consciousness. Um, this is a this is a difficult one. I'm, I've actually taken the position now of being a Mysterian. You know, the Mysterians are those that say it, it's not just uh, the hard problem of consciousness and we need to keep working on it. It's an insoluble problem. In fact, my uh, my next column in Scientific American is on the on the Mysterians in three areas: um, God, free will, and, and consciousness. So, um, in those, I claim with the consciousness one that it, it's it's not even the right question. You know, the hard problem of consciousness. What's right. it? What's it feel like to be something or someone else? I think it's a conceptually problematic uh, question because it can't be answered empirically. It's not that there's no test or experiment we can run. So, for example, what it's like to be a bat, you know, Thomas Nagel's famous essay, I claim it's not possible to know because if you bolted on all the neural um, you know, neural structures and, and, and giant ears and, and echolocation systems and wings and all that stuff. At some point, you, you would just be a bat. And, and you wouldn't be thinking, I'm a human inside the bat, and now right. I, see what, I, feel, I know what it feels like. So it, it's still, I think, stuck in the old homunculus idea that there's a little, a little theater in the brain and there's someone in there watching it. And then, uh, uh, you know, like what, what, what does your red look like? And, and my homunculus jumps out of my head into your head. And I see on the little theater Cartesian theater of your mind, what your red looks like. Well, that this is conceptually completely mistaken as you know. And, and so I, I think the question itself isn't going to get us anywhere. I think it's one of those conceptual mysteries that can never be solved by science. Yeah. At least uh, it doesn't seem like there's been, any progress in 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 trying to nail down like something as broad as what consciousness is i mean right it's it's just you know the it, the the easy so called easy problem you know tracking uh you know the neural networks for speech recognition or perception or whatever you know this is what neuroscientists do and they do it well and we're making a lot of progress and you know that's the route to go but you know, big philosophical questions. What's it like? What does your red look like? Is it the same as my red? They, they, you know, these are these are conceptually uh, problematic. We, we we can't know. There's no way to know that. Yeah. So I think the 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 pursuit for a utopia is an interesting one. When we're these these beings just moving around, driven driven by pleasure and I, th- I think it's interesting because we we come across many human beings that um, are driven by different modes of pleasure that a lot of other human beings don't find pleasurable so is it I mean I feel like living in Vancouver we're almost as close as we're gonna get to a uh, utopia here <laughs> <laughs> and we still have people uh, parents you know going around and you know uh, genitally mutilating their kids this in this in Vancouver? this version of utopia. Well, I mean, uh, when I when I look at you know, we still have a lot of infant circumcisions that are happening. Um, I was not aware of that. And, and, and I thought Canada had that, was outlawed that. No. Yeah. No. This uh, the circumcision is still a thing here, and you can uh, you can have um, 
You oh, have yes, child. yes. Okay, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my wife and I just had a, a son two years ago. He just turned two and we did not circumcise him. And, you know, she's from Germany and, and you know, the, in, in Europe, this is considered barbaric. Yeah. Uh, and nobody does it there. And, and, and I mean, almost no one in, in here. I think it is shifting the numbers I've seen. It's, it's shifting yeah. more and more. But, you know, really bumping up against that Judeo-Christian tradition that's been around for so long. Yeah. Well, even when we go back to uh, like the first kind of examples we have of this is going back to the ancient Egyptians where the priests started doing it not for doctrinal uh, reasons, but they were doing it as a fashion trend. Um, <laughs> right. And I mean, talk about dedication. <laughs> Yeah, but at what age? <laughs> yeah, I, adults? well, as I think adults, I think did. as far as I understand, this was happening as adults. But I I tend to spend a lot of time on this because I, I do I do look at this, and I'm with Joe Rogan on this. I there's so many circumcision apologists out there that are otherwise you know generally uh, good moral people that that you know they they'll say things. Uh, say these absurd things like I had my son circumcised because you know I wouldn't want to suck on a un uncircumcised dick Jesus. like this is the kind of stuff that's said on social media and you know you click on these profiles of people and you and you you expect to see all this like like gore porn and like terrible stuff on their wall but you see these like beautiful families and people just just regular people who are saying things like this and I, for, for circumcision, like as a general topic, I think it actually makes people go absolutely insane in their mind, uh, when they're trying to protect the decision they made, uh, if they happen to have circumcised their child or protecting the decision their parents made. Um, yeah. Yeah. and, and it's, yeah, I think it's, a, it's an absolute, um, just it's just absolute insanity and i de and i deal with it lots on my uh my facebook page and and uh on twitter I mean, anybody that would say that about oral sex um you know fellatio ha apparently has not watched how it's done i mean that the circumcised this the skin folds down that the, yeah. the, the head of the penis is not cover it up and you're okay anyway it's just yeah yeah that's just completely ignorant <laughs> yeah and i and i you know it's one of those topics where i i wish i didn't have to spend so much time on it because it's just this it's just this horrible subject for so many people to to discuss but it's it's uh it's a real problem and it and it's a it's a western problem yeah which is which is kind of unique well, when western, it comes to barbaric yeah, well, u.s western i mean again yeah. europe Euro Europeans almost never do this. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just a, a tradition. It's just one of those things that, in terms of moral progress, which I like to follow, uh, you know, it's just another one of those things that's going to be hard to fall. But if we, you know, look at like, say, uh, same sex marriage, how quickly that came about, I think the whole male circumcision thing can be turned around, uh, you know, in a generation if we just, you know, keep pre pu pu putting pressure and, on, on new new parents and just you know don't do it yeah well the percentages are dropping and i think it's uh, the last estimate was done in maybe 2010 and there's about 33 percent of the males on this planet have been mutilated at birth so i mean i and i think a lot of people are shocked by that number in the west uh in u.s and canada they they expect that that number would be a lot more but i mean in china and in japan this just isn't practiced and yeah and it's just although i would not equate it with female genital mutilation no not as, at all yeah, yeah okay good and that's something you know, I'm always really clear about is that, yeah. you know, before we start saving these uh, boys from being genitally mutilated, we need to focus on saving the, the yeah. w women from getting their clitorises chopped off. Yeah, because they, they have different uh, motives to, to, in the latter. The, the point is to control the sexual uh, choices and pleasures of women by men or yeah. by by parents or whatever, but mainly men. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, uh, yeah. So, well, so, so circumcision and genital mutilation aside is, is a, do you, do you see a way that a utopia can come about where we're, you know, we're living, you know, kind of like hippies from the sixties, you know, peace, man, everyone's getting along and, uh, <laughs> no one's, no one's, uh, right. pissed off at anyone. 
<laughs> I guess you haven't been to Santa Barbara if you say Van- Vancouver is as close to uh, Utopia <laughs> as you can get. It's pretty nice here. Yeah. Uh, I think again, it's it's a little bit like the consciousness thing. It's it's a conceptual error to conceive of a utopia. Because uh, I, I think uh, Moore had it right with his you know, original novel, Utopia, meaning no place. Not you, EU, Topia, like a good place, but you know, just Utopia, U T O P A, and no place. Um, and, and that's right, because um, it's not possible to define what a perfect perfect society would be because there's too much variation in what humans want. So you have to, uh, instead of uh, Utopia, I. Uh, I go along with uh, Kevin Kelly's idea of protopia, that is just pr- progress toward a better society such that in, in very gradual, incremental, stepwise um, progress where tomorrow is just slightly better than today. And that's really what we've experienced since the Enlightenment is these that I tracked in the moral arc is just these um, just in- incremental steps of, you know, civil rights and civil liberties and the abolition of slavery and torture and capital punishment and children's rights and workers' rights and women's rights and gay rights and, and, and you know, in the direction we're heading, you know, more, more and more animal rights and, and eventually AI or robot rights when AI achieves sentience. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes. Let's just see if we can get the murder rates slightly lower next year than they are this year or – um, you know, fewer wars or fewer people die in, in, in uh, civil wars and just things like that. And, and that, you know, as Steve Pinker's tracked as well, um, is really the mark of a true moral progress. There'll always be enough bad things that happen to fill the evening news such that if that's all you do is watch the headlines instead of the trend lines, you'll think things are bad and getting worse. But in fact, they're good and getting better. Right. And that's that's the most we can do. And and so you have to set up a political system that allows for constant change such that a liberal democracy in a way is like a scientific experiment where you you set it up, you run it for a few years, you tweak the variables and you run it for a few more years, you tweak the variables, you run it for a few more years. And the tweaking the variables are called elections. <laughs> right. And hopefully and, and legislation. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and change, then... change the law. So, for example, you know, we have 50 different states in the United States, so we have 50 different social experiments in taxation, gun control laws, these sorts of things. And you can look around. I mean, this is what political scientists and social social scientists do: is they compare data sets. Now, this is difficult to do. I mean, like uh, uh, we did an issue of Skeptic on gun control, and oh man, this is a tangled mess of statistical analyses, depending on who's doing it. But yeah. for the most part, you can see which kinds of gun control measures uh, have the best effect toward reducing the number of um, homicides and suicides by gun. And so from that, we can learn and go, okay, this seems to be working better here than over there. So let's try more of this one. Right. Right. Yeah. I I mean, so on the, on the gun issue, um, what, what is the best answer to these, uh, these shootings? (laughs) <laughs> there is no good answer be, you know, for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, the Second Amendment is never going to be overturned. Uh, you know, and, and the, the last two Supreme Court cases, particularly Heller in, in 2008, pretty much locked that down with, with uh, handguns being protected. And there's 350 million guns, and, and so there's more than one gun per person in, in the United States. And you know, we're never going to get them back. So that's over. That's gone. And and so the probabilities of somebody getting a gun who's mentally ill, crazy, mad, whatever, um, you can't stop that. So, and, and there are no gun control measures, uh, even on the books, that could stop the random, um, you know, the, the the black swan effect of you know a, a school shooting every so so many uh, weeks per year. Um, that 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 you can't do anything about that. Right. And uh, so all we can do is try to reduce the carnage by, I think, restricting the size of, you know, the, the magazines, how many bullets right. you can shoot before you have to reload. And in the reload moment there, there's a chance to stop the shooter. But th- those sorts of things, you know, background checks, you know, uh, pe- people that have had restraining orders put on them. These are um, these are mostly women victims of domestic violence. And. And uh, I mean, most women that die by gun are shot by their um, significant others or partners. Right. Um, and you know, so those are the sorts of things that aren't going to—that they're, they're not going to stop it, but they're going to reduce the carnage. I think is the best we can do at this right. point. Um, you mentioned uh, Stephen Pinker. 
Um, you have an event with him in Montreal uh, on September 16th, and that's produced by us at Pangburn Philosophy. Um, what are you uh, looking to get out of that event? What are you excited to speak to uh, Steve about? Well, I think, um, you know, Steve and I share, uh, you know, much of our worldviews. <laughs> so it's not like it's going to be me and a creationist or me and a, <laughs> or a climate denier, yeah. for sure. And, uh, you know, Steve and I are longtime good friends. And, um, and I just finished the Enlightenment Now, I reviewed it for science, and I think it's a fantastic book. I think one of the things we might discuss is this new phenomenon of the intellectual dark web, which was uh, published in, you know, by Barry Weiss in the New York Times today, um, that, you know, that I'm featured in along with others that you well know. Like yeah, Sam. And, I saw that uh, uh, article. It, it's uh, pretty fascinating. Yeah, so I, I think like a, a hard problem there for us is – you know, who, who, who's a legitimate voice in, in the conversation? And if we say, well, we'll talk to anybody, you know, Joe Rogan, for example, he'll talk to anybody. He'll talk to Alex Jones or whatever. You know, I, I don't think I would do that because um, people like Alex Jones or Milo, you know, it's a, if someone is just intentionally disruptive just for the sake of disrupting things and you don't actually know what they believe, like I have no idea what um, Alex Jones really believes yeah. as, far, as far as I know, the whole thing could be a put on. I mean, he in his divorce trial, he called himself a, a performance artist. You know, yeah. this whole thing is a joke. He might have been saying that because of his, the, the divorce uh, proceedings. Well, yeah, and he but, presents as a caricature. Like, yeah, he, he so, just, everything he does is a caricature. Yeah, so. I mean, so, but at least Colbert, for example, was honest about it in his, the Colbert report. He, yeah. he was honest. You know, I'm playing a fake conservative. You know, and so everybody was in on the joke. Uh, you know, that may not be the case always with, with uh, people like Alex Jones or Milo, you know, I think Milo's conservative, I think, but you know, I really don't know. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, there needs to be some, uh, I mean, free speech doesn't mean every single person who wants to have a platform has to be invited to speak at Harvard or Berkeley. Uh, there's simply not enough days in the year to host yeah. that many people. So you have to be somewhat discriminatory based on hopefully they have some credentials to speak or, you know, they have some integrity integrity or you know i'm not so that would be a hard one like you know, how do we know yeah well i think it, uh, it it depends on what the subject is it's like uh, uh if if the discussion is um uh humanism i i don't think there's a terminal degree in humanism so it's like it's <laughs> right. like so it, it, you know most people should be able to discuss humanism but if it's a if it's a discussion on evolution at harvard university you would expect you know a Brett Weinstein or a Richard Dawkins. Hey, right. someone with training and, yeah. and and does it for a living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could see that. Um, I, one of my recent Scientific American column I wrote about utilitarianism and Kant's deontology. Uh, in the context of every month, I have a, a column and I have to come up with something new. Like, is there some new study, a survey, a published paper, a book, some event that happened? Or else, you know, why am I writing about it? And then tie it into some, you know, deeper theoretical issue related to science somehow. So anyway, I was just happened to be reading this paper on utilitarianism by some scholars, um, Kahan at Oxford University and his colleagues. And they were kind of complaining that utilitarianism has gotten a bad rap because it's always focused on the sacrificial aspects of utilitarianism, like in the trolley problem. Is it okay to sacrifice the one to kill the Five, that kind of thing. Right. And and so in, in their paper, they say, hey, that's the dark side of utilitarian. There's a good side, you know, and, and so that, that's what the paper was about. So I wrote about that and and then basically, uh, you know, said, well, I, I like the idea of natural rights and I said a few things about that. Well, anyway, Massimo Pigalucci and a few other professional moral philosophers <laughs> were, were not too amused at, at an right. amateur like me. You know, I, I'm a historian of science. I have, you know, I've read, I'm, I'm able to read the, you, uh, um, you know, Bentham and Mill and, and Kant and so on, but, but, uh, you know, I didn't spend six years getting a PhD in it, you know, so I could kind of see why they'd be a little miffed, like, you know, how come Shermer is commenting on this? What does he know? Right. And, uh, but on the other hand, you know, if you're, if you're credentialed and, and you're a professional, you, you know, moral philosophy is not like quantum physics. I mean, I can't read quantum physics, uh, but, but I can, I can read moral philosophy. I, I think I understand the difference between act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism yeah. and weak rule utilitarianism versus strong rule utilitarianism right. and the difference between strong rule utilitarianism and Kantian deontology. But 
to me, they all start to blend into one another you know, with all these labels. And, uh, and so this is one reason why I, I, I went into science instead of philosophy. Yeah, well, I would rather, you know, uh, these other intellectuals go after why your argument is wrong as opposed to, you know, this argument from authority saying that you don't have the authority on the issues to... Right. Um, well, Massimo did to his credit. I When I called him out for that, he said, all right. And, and so he blasted me with a, a pretty strong critique. Fine. Right. That's fine. Right. And so we went back and forth a couple of times and that's all published online. But yeah, but that is the way to do it. I mean, Massimo and I are friends. And, right. you know, this is the idea of the of the intellectual dark web or and the kind of stuff that you, you're doing, uh, putting on public events. And Joe Rogan does and Dave Rubin does is just people that don't disagree, don't agree with each other. Talk to each other. Right. And there's, in a couple of days, I'm sitting down with um, Ben Shapiro for an hour for his Ben Shapiro Sunday, uh, new Sunday show he's doing. Oh, right and, on. I, I look yeah, forward to depth, hearing in that. Yeah. conversations. Yeah, his first yeah. guest, Jordan Peterson, and I think I'm his second or third guest. Anyway, uh, you know, he's pro-life and I'm pro-choice. I'm going to see if I can swing him over. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, yeah. I probably won't, but, but, and, and we'll shake hands and, and, and have a good time, but I'm going to I'm gonna try and yeah. Uh, so yeah he's a he's he's quite a crafty debater um that guy oh uh, he's a fast talker <laughs> he's a fast talker and you silver got a tongue devil. <laughs> silver tongue devil and uh and peterson he's got that quality as well uh one thing i i've noticed by hanging out with jordan a bit um oh he does yes no he's yeah. very good he knows what he's doing on stage he's a masterful uh presenter and rhetorician yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a skill. You know, people think uh, all you have to do is have some good ideas or be able to think clearly. No. Presentation, like the ability to write uh, or speak or be funny or be clever or witty. You know, people think, oh, who's Bill Nye, the science guy to be on TV all the time? Or Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, he's not a real scientist. Hey, you know, you try going on TV and seeing what you if you can explain this in three minutes while yeah. your host is interrupting you. Or the audience is interrupting you, or you know, can, you know, can you really communicate these? Yeah. And be clever, be funny, be witty, be sharp. Yeah. And I have snappy comebacks and and and, and repertoire and, and and dialogue. Can you do it? Yeah. Most people can't do it. It's a skill. And it's and mo a lot of people can't do it when they don't have like, a, you know, when they don't have to rely on empirical evidence as the thing that you're presenting. It's yes. like comedians can write their 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 stuff about anything, but when you're when you're trying to, you know, bring some humor into empirical data and the scientific method, it's it makes it that much harder. You should um, you should book a live show with me and Ben Shapiro or me yes. and Dennis Preger. I was you know uh, Ruben did a show with me and Preger, the Preger, the conservative radio guy, and uh, he's also very sharp. He may be. Uh, every bit as good as Shapiro. He's a lot older and has, has been doing this for decades. And, yeah. um, you know, his old test, his knowledge of the old Testament is pretty extensive. I, but again, I, I like I said, uh, uh, I think on Ruben's show that, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I could beat Ben Shapiro in a debate, but I could tie him. I'm pretty sure I could tie him, yeah. <laughs> whatever that means in a debate. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, but some of these things I think don't have the correct answer. It's like, like when I debate it, creationist or a climate denier I, I can just whip them with facts yeah but abort you know things like abortion or um you know what you know what the difference between right and wrong and how you really know you know some of the big philosophical issues you know they, they don't have a simple right answer like you know it's it's 400 parts per million of co2 gases going up to 500 parts per million by 2100 therefore right. boom done <laughs> not like that with abortion or gun no. control or, no, these, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's definitely not the same deal when talking about those issues. There's, um, I've, I've heard, uh, yeah, yeah. When I hear an issue come up and I hear two great arguments on, on opposite sides of, of the debate, then, uh, I, I typically am really interested in those topics because then we, we got one that's really worth debating. Yeah, that's right. Uh, although, I mean, it's not always the case that there's two sides to every story. Again, like with climate. Yeah, you know, With exactly. the climate debate, it, it, whenever you see these things on TV, it's always the same one or two so-called climate skeptics uh, uh, because there aren't very many. There's only a couple. Um, and, and, and that's a sign that there's something um, – fair, fair, there's, a, there's a strong scientific consensus if – you know, 99% of scientists are on one side of thing. They're probably right. Now, it's yeah. not always the case. Uh, you know, sometimes the majority is wrong, but not. But but usually not. Usually the majority are are 
you know, have a, there's a good reason why there's a consensus. And it's yeah. not like a, a democracy where, you know, we all meet on the weekend and vote to see if climate change is real or not. Uh, yeah. It's that in, there's an independent corroboration. Um, there's different lines of inquiry uh, from completely different fields, you know, geography and geology and climate uh, science and e ecology and, you know, glacier, the study of glaciers and, and on and on and on. And these people, they don't even know each other. They don't go to the same conferences. They publish in different journals. And yet they're all coming to the same conclusion. Right. That should give us uh, confidence that the whole thing is probably on the right track. These, yeah. yeah. Is it mostly uh, is it mostly conspiracy thinking? That's keeping, you know, these large groups of people from accepting climate science? Um, yeah, it's, well, not, not conspiracy. It's more a political signaling, virtue signaling okay. for your political tribe. Um, so, for example, when a conservative hears climate change or global warming, you know, their brain autocorrects that to anti-capitalism, anti-free right. market. Uh, you know, big government intervention into the marketplace and uh, the economy. And they're not thinking parts per million of CO2 gases. They're thinking government regulation of industry. And that's against my core principles of what I believe. So therefore, I'm against it. And uh, and they do the same thing. Religious conservatives do the same thing with evolution. You know, they don't hear about punctuated equilibrium or or DNA you know, testing and comparing across species. You know, they don't know anything about that or care about it. It's that, you know, Darwinism equals atheism equals lack of morality equals communism. Equal, you know, and then, the, you know, their brain just explodes and goes, that can't be right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, liberals do the same thing uh, on other issues, you know, like, like uh, nuclear power, for example, or GMOs. I mean, you know, GMOs is one of the great things to, to lift uh, people people out of poverty, you know, stop this, the, you know, hunger and starvation of hundreds of millions of people. Uh, but, you know, they just don't think clearly on those things. But surveys show that, uh, that conservatives and liberals equally support science in all other areas that are not hot button issues. Right. Yeah. It seems like once they start affecting you right now, it's like, it's, it's like with medical, medical science, it's, you're 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 gonna spend your last breath dialing nine one one when you get in an, a car accident as opposed to spending that last breath praying. Um, I think <laughs> right. most people are gonna take that option. That's right. Yeah, they can. Yeah, you can pray for me when I when I'm in the ambulance on my way to the best medical technology it, that's available. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So uh, I did want to talk about AI. Um, so when I sit at a bar with Sam Harris. And we're just generally talking and we're just shooting the shit. And then once we get on the subject of AI, there is this massive shift in him <laughs> and things yeah. become very serious. And he, he is legitimately terrified of what can happen along with Elon Musk and a few others, uh, uh, may, maybe even the majority. Um, and I think, and, and, and a guy like Steve Pinker uh, kind of like, maybe chuckles a bit at that and says that there's, you know, any great, any great engineer who, who would be able to design a, an artificial intelligence would, would design it properly so that it wouldn't overthrow us. What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm with Pinker on this. Um, I uh, wrote about this in Skeptic. We did a whole issue on is AI a threat or not? And I had pro and con and, 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 and it was a great debate. But um, you know, I, I'm with Pinker on this that it's it's not an existential threat. First of all, we have to quit using that word. It's so overused. Existential threat. Everything is an existential threat. You know, I mean, it, it, like terrorism. We did another issue of Skeptic on that. And you know, the idea. That, let's say the worst case scenario: ISIS got a nuke and, and and detonated it in New York City. Right. And you know, millions were killed. Do you, th you think President Trump or whoever, Obama, any president, is just going to hand the keys over to ISIS and go, well, you know what? We're like, it. it's all yours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you did it. You yeah. know, you can have the country. No. Yeah. Okay. And same thing with, you know, AI. I just, at, at some point, you know, the Tesla leaps up onto the sidewalk and mows down pedestrians because you programmed it to get you to LAX as quickly as possible and yeah. there was traffic. You know, the moment that happened, you, you, you think government regulators are not going to leap on uh, Musk and go, hey, you, you, this happens again. We're shutting you down. Yeah. And, you know, so he, he gets it, calls his engineers in there and go, hey, we need, you know, double reduction safety systems on our brakes or whatever you know, this, so that this never happens again. 
And, you know, that's how technologies evolve. Kevin Kelly makes this point um, beautifully that, that Pinker summarizes in Enlightenment Now that, you know, the more complex the technology, the more potentially dangerous it is, the more people are involved in it, the more complex the systems are. Therefore, the harder it would be for like a terrorist to get it or for, you know, one single unit to, to, to have a runaway effect and, and, you know, take over the world or turn the entire planet into paper clips or, you know, whatever your scenario is. Right. Um, it, it's just, uh, I'm not worried about it. I mean, I lived through the Y2K thing and it was the exact same kinds of conversations uh, on the evening news every night. It's coming, it's coming. Oh my God, we're, you know, the whole thing is going to, President Clinton's on there going, oh, we have to do something, you know, and, and all our top scientists say this is going to happen and, and, and nothing happened. And that's usually how it goes. I still and, don't get what the hell people thought was going to happen with that. With Y2K. Well, it was yeah, the, yeah. That that when when we hit 2000, that it would click back to 1900, and the and the programs would quit running, and planes <laughs> would fall out of the sky, and and you know, hospital units would would be turned off, and people would die, and you know, and just you know, none of that happened. I yeah. think it was just all over. But typically, um, that's you know, you know, almost all. Of, these kinds of existential threat scenarios are almost always along those lines, uh, that they're too exaggerated. Not that we shouldn't pay attention. Uh, I mean, if you want, um, you know, computer scientists, go ahead and take credit for it. Like, yeah, it didn't happen because we did something about it. Okay, fine. But, you know, and some companies did, but, uh, you know, most m middle sized to small companies and businesses, they did nothing to do anything about it. They couldn't afford to call in a team of computer scientists to you know to worry about this so they did nothing and nothing happened to them so it, it appears it was all overblown and i strongly suspect that's the case and even though there are some high profile people like musk and and uh bill gates and stephen hawking and so on and, and sam but but most people like eric schmidt at google you know he said not worried about it you know and 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 i, I suspect most people at microsoft that are just sitting there working they're not worried about it yeah, um, and I guess the, uh, I guess one of the fears is that some kind of AI technology would be created, and then all of a sudden we'd lose we'd lose touch with it, and it would go through the internet and create other shit, and and it would create this, and then all of a sudden before we knew it, it would be widespread, and but I mean it it uh, I, to me it just uh, it just sounds like fantasy. I think so. Yep. It's it's like a science fiction scenario. And OK, granted, uh, the AI uh, dooms, doomsayers are not going the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator route. They, right. they recognize that's Hollywood baloney. Uh, and their arguments are, are, are much more subtle and, and, and interesting and important. But still, I, I, I just don't think it's there. Um, you know, Sam is he's really good at thought experiments. You know, this is what he is trained in. He does it really well. He's incredibly articulate. Uh, but I think Pinker matched him uh, sentence for sentence in their discussion. Um, I don't know if you if this is a Pangburn event or not, but uh, this is online um, and, uh, for Steve's book, Enlightenment Now. And, and so they got into that uh, toward the end. Yeah. It's perfect. I mean, Steve, Steve matched him point for point and you know and, and you can take your pick who you thought won or whatever but I, I think I think Pinker made the stronger point that um, it, that it's not an existential threat the fact that people take it seriously enough to talk about it and, and maybe this does have an effect on the you know programmers or government regulators you know before they turn loose automated uh, auto, automatic driving cars and so on um, there'll be enough checks and balances but you know this idea again like the you know the trolley problem you know the, the Tesla's driving along there's five people in the, in the side, sidewalk or or you know in the, the crosswalk there's you know two people in the crosswalk but there's three passengers in the car so it's better to kill the two okay how about you just have better sensors and, and better brakes right. and then nobody dies <laughs> right you know that's the, the you know technology is the solution to a lot of uh, i think ethical issues right so let's talk a little bit about uh this god character um, God, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so is the world becoming more secular? I think it is. Oh, yeah. So for sure. Uh, I mean, we've known for about five years now that the rise of the nuns is 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 a real effect. That is the people who tick the box for no religious affiliation. Um, that is a third. That's a 25 percent of all Americans and a third of millennials, the people born after 19. 80 and now it's 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 going to be uh, about probably 50 percent of i jenners once they 
they get up to age of in their 20s and 30s when they would become religious, they won't. So the trends, like most of these demographic trends, they, you know, older people are slower to change. Um, like with gay rights, for example, it's you know, mainly supported by millennials and resisted by baby boomers and, and older. Uh, and that, But that's the way it's going for the nuns. Now, the nuns are not necessarily atheist, agnostic, skeptics. Um, they're not you know, leaping into membership of the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. You know, a lot of them are going to the Deepak Chopras of the world. They yeah. they they tick the box, spiritual but not religious, and on the dating sites, for example. And by, that's a good proxy for, I think the effect is they still think there's something going on. In in Heavens on Earth, I reported on this uh, massive survey, huge uh, survey of Americans. Again, it was like you know, 10 percent said they're atheists. And of those, about a third said they believe in the survival of consciousness after death. Now, they, they don't think they're going to sit next to Jesus in heaven with God. Uh, but they, but there's something – now, they didn't ask, so I don't know what they're thinking. But they're probably thinking something like you know, a Buddhist idea of consciousness. Everything is consciousness. So consciousness, like Deepak says, you know, when you die, you just return to where you were before you were born, which is consciousness. And uh, or something like a, a a scenario of Ray Kurzweil and the uploading the mind into the cloud. There's something like a universal cloud that your consciousness returns to. I th think a lot of these atheist or secular millennials, the nuns, I think they they're still clinging on to something like that. Yeah, it's a I I, I think in general uh, it's a difficult concept to realize that you know, you're going to die. <laughs> um, well, you can't, you yeah. can't conceive of it because yeah. to conceive of something, you have to be alive. So when I say right. conceive of, you know, being dead, it'd be like, uh, imagine being unconscious. Right. Well, I, I can't cause I'm conscious. Yeah. All I think, <laughs> I have I, to be conscious. all I think when you, when you say that is blackness. Yeah. Blackness. <laughs> right. Or, you know, it's like yeah. anybody who's gone under general anesthesia, you know, they, they have you count a few numbers and, you know, it's just boom, boom, lights out. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's it. And that's probably what death is like. Now, if it, if it's true, uh, that after that, for me, I wake up and whatever that means, consciousness and, 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 and I'm in this other place and there's my friends, Carl Sagan and Stephen Jay Gould and my parents and, and so on. It's like, okay, well, this is cool. Uh, I didn't yeah. know this, but all oh, right. Yeah. Uh, now I can't, can I go back and rewrite, uh, a, a new addition to my book, <laughs> which yeah. I said this was all bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, probably not, but you know, I, so I'm not against the idea of there being an afterlife. Uh, it, it'd be fine. Not, not, not the afterlife like the uh, Christian religion portrays, which I think would be incredibly boring. Um, yeah. he, he, Christopher Hitchens called it the celestial North Korea. You know, you have this dictator yeah. that knows everything you know and, and, and knows all your thoughts and controls everything you do. That does not sound heavenly to me. Yeah, and uh, uh, Hitch so. always followed that up by saying, "And at least in North Korea, you can fucking die." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can't even leave the party in yeah. the Christian scenario. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Okay, and I thought uh, for the last topic here, I thought we should touch on energy. Have you have you covered at Skeptic uh, nuclear power? Um, we haven't done it. We haven't done an issue on that. That is something I want to address soon because I do think that's the answer to our energy issues. Um, I'm worried about that Germany and France, for example, are now going backwards on that um, uh, issue because of the Fukushima. Uh, incident and this is again part of this whole existential threat fears that people have that are irrational yeah um that is you know i mean you know in terms of like um a three mile island no one died um chernobyl i don't know it was like 50 to 100 people maybe tops died and cancer rates in the area went up just barely measurable statistically you know in the noise above barely in the noise above the background rate of cancer right uh, before chernobyl and fukushima the major problem was you know not the the, the plant but the uh but the water <laughs> just you know the just this the safety mechanisms around the plant right and storms and so on so uh, you know that we have to go that route uh because if you look at the number of people who die related to coal for example, yeah, we just have gotten used to that, yeah. and as if you know that, uh, that 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 one if one person dies in a nuclear accident, then we have to shut the whole thing down, and yet we're just used to thousands of people getting black lung disease or, or industrial accidents and so on, and, and we just accept that because yeah. we're used to it. I mean, I I almost think it we need to rename it. 
instead of nuclear nuclear power, we can call it like bright power or something. Yeah, I, I just think a new uh, name would do that very well because that's a good I idea because I, yeah, I, I agree that because um, when people hear the word nuclear, they shit themselves and they think, uh, you know, these giant explosions and, and killing millions of people. So they their minds just shut down. But uh, I, well, it, well, it touches some psychology of fear that it's invisible. You can't see it, can't yeah. taste it, can't smell it. You know, it's like a, this this in, uh, preternatural poison. Um, that's different from anything else that, that kind of touches some of those psychological, uh, fears we have about the dark, about the unseen, um, and uncontrollable and, 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 you know, and, and then of course the, the, the major story with, with, with the three mile Island is that that movie China syndrome came out just the week before that happened. And, and that, so that, uh, again, no one died in three mile island but but you know people just saw that film and movies have an incredible way of of touching people's um fears and emotions you know hollywood has really got it dialed in exactly how to the right music and the right edits to get you to be afraid of something and they did that with uh with the china syndrome and so ever since then you know nuclear power plants i mean nuclear power plants you know the second generation now there's third and fourth generations proposed and people working on these smaller units you know, I'm, I'm especially encouraged that Stuart Brand, the whole Earth Catalog guy, is super hardcore green environmentalist. But, you know, he's totally in favor of nuclear power. And, you know, the, having those kind of people on our side is good. Yeah. And, and, and I think uh, I would urge people who are uh, interested in investing their money into uh, new energy sources to really take a look at nuclear power and, and you know, the the pros and cons to it and i think you'll uh, see pretty quickly that it is a great um resource we got to do it i mean uh, the fossil fuel in terms of, like the 10,000 years of human history uh, civilization for example I, I think you know um fossil fuels is just going to be a short little window um it's the same thing with with uh, electric cars i mean they've been around since the 1910s uh, there were as many electric taxis as gas powered taxis in New York City in the 1920s. But, you know, the, the because of just the, the history and the unfolding of who got a market head start and so on, you know, the research and development of battery technology, for example, just, just lay dormant. And um, it, it really, it's it was because of Musk. Um, yeah. Just making a cool car. I drive a Tesla. I, I'm never going back. I mean, I haven't been to a gas station in three years. Yeah. And and now I see driving around next to me a, th a Model Three that's it, that's better than my Model S at half the price. Yeah. In three years. It's unbelievable. And, you know, yeah. And it, and my car goes 250 miles on a charge. The the, the Model Three goes 300 miles on a charge. This is how, how it's going to go. And they're all doing it now. Yeah. They have to. Market forces. You know, Ford, GM, BMW, Porsche, they're all coming out with super cool cars that go fast and they go far. And and, and I was thinking about – and with the self-driving aspect as well, I was thinking about this. My two-year-old son, he may never drive a car. Yeah. <laughs> in, in 15 years when he could get his driver's license, he, he may not need one. Yeah, that's and, unbelievable. And, I know it. So the whole thing with uh, with driving cars may be a window of maybe 150 years in all of human history. It'll yeah. it'll it was it wasn't there. Then it was there for this short window, and now it's gone. Yeah, <laughs> that's, just that's fascinating. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today, Michael. Uh, all right, Travis. Have a good been conversation. A, yeah, it's been an honor having you on, and I look forward to seeing you in Montreal, September 16th, with Mr. Pinker. Should be epic. Yeah, it will be for sure. All right, and everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Today I am joined by the polarizing British author and political commentator, Douglas Murray, who is an outspoken critic of Islam and the European refugee crisis in his newest book, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam. Murray explores two main factors that explain why European civilization as we know it will not survive. Thanks for taking the time today, Douglas. Very good to be with you. Great. So the word uh, polarizing, I've noticed, is frequently used to describe you. Why is that? Yeah, I have to say I'm slightly surprised myself. Um, 
I don't think anything I say is especially polarizing. I, um, I've been a writer since I was, well, since I've been a grown up and uh, written on all sorts of things, published books on literature, on history, on politics, on terrorism. But uh, it's true that every issue to do with what I write about in my latest book is a hot potato issue, as we would say in Britain. But, you know, my, my view is that the only point of, of writing and like the only point of thinking is to try to get to some truth. And it happens sometimes that the truths that you're trying to get to um, involve you going through received wisdom, uh, involve you walking against certain crowd mentalities of your time. And I've certainly found that's the case with this latest book. I mean, it's been a bestseller in every country it's come out in so far. Um, and it's, it's been published around the world in multiple languages. And um, it, it, to my mind, it, it tries to cut through a set of fallacies that I think we've, we've fallen into. But if, any, if anything is polarizing, as it, as it were, it's, it's just that the, the facts I'm, I'm looking at, the facts I've looked into for years and have traveled across the globe looking at for years, are very, very difficult and awkward facts. Yeah, the, um, but you know, you only have two options in the face of that. One is to try to unpick them, however popular or unpopular it is, and the other is to lie. And I mean, I know a lot of writers who take that second option, but I right. I've never seen it as being worth doing. Uh, yeah, one one writer that comes to mind recently is Ezra Klein. How he? Uh, oh yeah, you know. <laughs> He, it seems like a guy like him, he would rather hide uh, scientific findings if they don't happen to um, fall yeah. in line with the wishing, uh, wishful I think, thinking. I think, by the way, that's a very common thing at the moment. I mean, maybe it always was, but there is this tendency to just, just try to avoid and shut down facts um, and ideas if they are awkward to you and to your received wisdom. And, you know, I, at any rate, would like to think, and I think I have in my in my career, have, have shown that you know if, if if the facts change, then my opinion's going to change. And um, if I discover facts I didn't know, then they're going to have an impact, and they should. Yeah, the, but the, it is amazing how many people like Klein are willing to just block them off, shut people down, shut them up. I yeah. don't see it working, but yeah, this is this is measles vaccine avoidance type of thinking. Uh, yeah, that gets people into trouble. They just—it's it, anti. It, it's this poison of anti-science. The, so the—it's uh, interesting that you brought up truth there. So I've, I've recently did a podcast and an event with uh, Jordan Peterson, and um, mm. he was actually on stage with uh, Matt Dillahunty, who you will be on stage with a week from today in uh, yeah. in New York, and um, and truth. Uh, you know, with Jordan in a lot of his talks with other thinkers uh, becomes this uh, huge topic because it is the other speakers tend to be shocked by how much um, uh, Peterson, how much weight he puts on this idea of metaphoric truth, and and it should somehow be taken as seriously as uh, the the truths that we find through science, even if they're uh, just temporary. Right. This is this is a, a landmine issue in this area at the moment. Right. Um, but I, I mean, I, I I I think I see what Jordan is is, is getting at there. Um, uh, but uh, yes, I mean, I can see also why some people resent the idea of metaphorical truth being put on the same plane as demonstrable scientific truth, for instance. Right. Um, it's almost as if you need another word in the language for the thing that he's quite rightly trying to bring to people's attention there. Um, yeah. Like it, truth with a capital T or a lowercase t. Yeah. Instance, I don't know, something like that. Exactly. And I mean, you know, a lot of us in the secular humanist community kind of look at that as, as kind of the new wave of of Christian apologetics where, you know, they're, they're kind of putting God into this untestable realm. I mean, I, I can't see, uh, I, I can't see a circumstance where in Jordan Peterson's, um, way of understanding truth where, you know, th things like Santa Clauses and, and leprechauns and, and 
you know, anything you, you wish up or imagine uh, all of a sudden is brought into existence. Right, right. No, it's, it's, uh, well, we, have to, we have to concede that we are, though, at the moment in some kind of, I don't like to say interim period, but we, there is so much churn going on at the moment in, in the world of ideas as we're trying to adapt to certain facts and truths that we've discovered right. and that indeed have, have gone a sweeping across the culture and for good uh, in large part, but also partly in, for ill. And, 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 you know, everyone's trying to find a way to uh, to, to reason their way through this. And I, I, right. I'm not sure we're all going to arrive at any consensus very soon, but, but once you accept that this is the middle of some very significant churn, in the culture, it, it, it makes me, at any rate, slightly more relaxed about the interim yeah. period. Yeah, I think it's a move in the positive direction. I, I think uh, the more or the less people we have walking around thinking that you know they have the supreme beings uh, on their side, I think this is this is where belief in supreme beings, uh, you know, you can fall into a trap of smothering your child, thinking that you're doing the right thing by delivering them to God. Yeah, so we have the uh, we have the event coming up in New York, and and just a bit on Matt Dillahunty. Um, so Matt's a former Southern Baptist of 25 years. He sought to be a minister. Uh, he found his way out of religion, and now is a quite a prominent figure in the promotion of uh, positive atheism and and secular humanism. So I I assume you guys are definitely going to be getting into the discussion about. Uh, Christianity's role in in human history, and maybe maybe mm. if there if there was a different way or a better way, or or was this a, uh, essentially inevitable? As I've as I've heard from Brett Weinstein uh, recently, and kind of his take on uh, on religion. Right. Yes. I mean, this is a, this is another thing that's now being really significantly fought over. Um, and you just take a step back from the every day's news and you can see that the elements of this this debate are going on all the time and very feverishly um there's a there's a case in uh, britain at the moment uh, obviously where i'm from uh, about a, a poor young boy who's ill and is an issue about uh, whether the doctors uh, have made the right calls about withdrawing life support and all this sort of thing and it, and it's it's become, you know, this boy's name is on everybody's lips in the UK, and there's a massive uh, uh, campaign by, among others, Catholic groups and others, and there's a, uh, and you know, you just take a step back from that, which is just this tragic, awful thing that's happening at the moment. But you take a step back from it, you realize actually, you know, this is again, this is this is all being fought over in this in this same terrain, this sort of intermediary terrain um, of trying to work out what what the sort of new rules are and what our own what our own presumptions are about ethics uh, including medical ethics and uh, you, you know it, it's as i say you can get a certain amount of peace from the simple realization that this is we're trying to work out how we got to where we've got to as well as where we're going next Right. You know, and what role religion played in that, and which bits we discard, or whether we discard it completely, uh, and this is um, this is going to this is going to rumble on for a long time. Yeah, I, you know, I, a lot of people do hold the opinion that if we would have discarded with uh, religion earlier on, uh, it may have been catastrophic because it was used as a, as a bit of a guide. Um, I, I think I see ways that um, if we would have kind of essentially, uh, for lack of a better term, put our faith in, in things like art independently from, uh, you know, uh, believing that supernatural personal gods mm. exist, um, that maybe that would have fulfilled that void. But maybe maybe it is that fear of the all-powerful God that kept people in check uh, through history. It's also possible that we're just we're just wired in a certain way. I mean, yeah. I re I read quite a lot on this that 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 you know even if, as you say, for instance, you got to art without religion playing any part, um, with no certainty that, that that somehow you wouldn't create a religiosity around art. Um, right. 
you know, I mean, there are plenty of people who, for instance, you know, confuse religion and aesthetics um, and vice versa. Uh, so it, it may be that there's a, I mean, Brett knows this better than anyone, but there, maybe there's a, there's a wiring issue on this. Yeah, I, I think Brett is convinced of that. It's a, it's a fascinating subject <laughs> on the subject like altruism and all oh. these things. It's, it's an extraordinary very very deep and important discussion to have right right um yeah and then we'll be in uh dublin on july 14th and london on july 16th you will be uh, uh, uh I, I think i'm gonna sit it with you in between sam and jordan maybe you're the more reasonable person in this crowd <laughs> <laughs> i might keep them apart like right. a, a boxing uh, uh, moderator yeah yeah um, no, I'm looking forward to these events as well, very much. Um, uh, I know Sam uh, pretty well, and uh, I've known him for some years, and um, I know Jordan less well, but have followed him for some time, and uh, have a very great amount of sympathy with them, both of their points of view and arguments on various things, and differ from both on various points, but uh, it's it's going to be a really really interesting evening uh, in dublin and uh, again then in london um uh, yeah and and uh, looking forward to a packed out arena on on sam and jordan um you know they're they've been poking at each other a bit on twitter and uh and kind of kind of doing the uh the pre-boxing match um way in uh, <laughs> uh peacocking sam and jordan are both um very reasonable people as far as i can tell and the stuff i've heard them talk about i mean the way what what jordan has to uh provide on the side of uh, self-authoring and anything really directly related to clinical psychology i think he's a genius on those subjects um but then uh, you know but then i do i get i get perplexed and i have a hard time understanding his position when it comes to uh come to truth and and it comes to uh a, he seems to be struggling you know, you know they, i've i've talked to him about his god belief and i actually think he and under my definition of what atheism is i think he is an atheist right well that this is a very interesting subject in itself um uh, i don't want to presume anything and that this isn't on the basis of a particular conversation with right. jordan but um, my impression is that, among other things, he, this isn't to diminish his thought on this matter, but there is a there is a type of person who um, I think, for instance, of the English philosopher Roger Scruton, uh, who is, in my guess, um, almost certainly an atheist, but believes that there is a damage done by admitting that publicly. Or, or taking too strident a stance in such a direction. Uh, this is this is something, by the way. This is something which um, Schopenhauer uh, uh, um, talked about almost two hundred years ago in the in the uh, dialogue on religion. Uh, what he describes as the tragedy of the clergy, that the clergy can't admit that what they're doing is talking in metaphor. They can never admit that, or the, or the whole thing stops. Right because you, you can't get people to follow a metaphor. So I I understand that particular predicament. I'm not certain that where Jordan is, but it's 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 one possibility. And as I say, I can think of other cases of, of prominent thinkers who who basically hold that sort of almost clerical line. And and, and it, it again, I mean, it's understandable in a way if you take that view, then it's understandable you wouldn't want to admit or confess certain things in public for the damage they might do. Um, uh, but I think it's it's more than that as well with uh, Jordan. Um, there is a there is a there is something I've seen in other I mean other thinkers like um, Richard Holloway, who used to be the bishop bishop of Edinburgh and who sort of became an atheist whilst he was bishop. Um, he, I think, probably had that. Had um, he's in a similar space to where Jordan is, I think, of, and, and where I, I have some sympathy with of the of not wanting to discard the whole story, right? Um, in case, in uh, but, but reckon, I mean, I recognise, for instance, that 
the the the, the stories of the Bible, for instance, uh, um, are not uh, uh, could be could be seen as being like the work of Ovid, um, right. but nobody believes that the metamorphosis occurred. Now, but we recognise that they carry truth, a story of some truth about human desire, for instance, in the uh, um, case of the metamorphosis of Daphne. Um, and longing and so on. And I think we recognize that, but I think that there is obviously this problem in relation to doing this with biblical story, which is the very strong response from believers, which is, look, if, I, if it's not true, then it's nothing. Right. So, so people walking that tightrope, and it is a tightrope, have a very, I think, have a very difficult job. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it is it is high wire stuff. Yeah, if I mean, if you have, I mean, anyone who's trying to argue a position where they where they don't have evidence and you know they don't have uh, at least evidence for uh, the kind of truth that's practical in reality, because I'm not sure that metaphoric truth has any practicality um, as far as you know understanding what is actually real. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, I sure as hell wouldn't want the task of, of, you know, trying to defend that position. I've, I've tried to put myself on that side and it's, and that's mean, I can't get over the, the fact if I'm trying to come at it from a theistic perspective that, um, you know, S Superman, any of these, uh, characters that we've created essentially could be wished into existence, uh, in this uh, you know, if a, if a lot of people took it seriously, I, I think I would put it another. I wouldn't say wished into existence. I'd say um, wished out of existence in a way. It, mm. it, the, because do you remember? Um, I mean, I'm sure he was a friend of yours. Well, the late friend Christopher Hitchens used to have this very um, very strong uh, argument about um, be about believers having all of their work ahead of uh, ahead of them. Right. Remember that, right? Yes, so yes. Great risk of Christopher's. Yeah, and um, uh, but I think that you can also say that the inverse is true to some extent, which is that there has been a presumption in I think in the last uh, couple of decades, in particular, among some people in the atheist community, that that um, once you you demonstrated the illogical, unprovable nature of belief that um, everything else was sort of clear. Yeah. Um, and I've always taken the view that, no, I mean, again, <laughs> your work starts from there. Um, <laughs> for instance, on, on ethics, uh, some people, I, I don't think this is the case now when we're already clearly into a much more uh, textured, yeah. uh, c complex and necessarily complex part of the discussion about ethics. But um, I think, you know, in the last 15 years, there have been a lot of people who gave the impression that, you know, if you do away with God, then the rest is obvious. And, um, and actually, the former chief rabbi in the UK once said to me, uh, um, said that people present their ethics as being self-evident when they're self-evidently not. And, and I write about this quite a bit in my, la in my most recent book, what happens when a culture starts to worry that ethics it took for granted might be quite unusual, hmm. globally speaking. Um, uh, and that's not, by the way, just religious. Um, I think of it in terms of liberal politics as well. I think yes. a lot of people getting nervous that the presumptions we, we have made about the, you know, the predominance of a certain attitude within politics might actually be uh, some kind of terrible, you know, wonderful, but a blip. Yeah. Um, so these, 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 underneath all of these discussions at the moment are these tremors, as I see it, of a general realization that, that we, might, we might need to shore some of this up. Some people in that will definitely seize on parts of religion uh, to help them sort of shore it up. Um, but others, uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, well, on the, the, the regressive left, uh, we have these this thug mentality created out of essentially tr trigger culture and we have mm. these uh these 
these uh, gangs of yeah. far lefties showing up to you know silence free speech. Uh, we have yeah. it in Canada all the time, and uh, it's uh, incredible development. This um, it's 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 like a, a form of secular inquisition in a way. Mm. Um, it's very, it's a very worrying development, and it has to be it has to be countered unbelievably vociferously. Um, you, you, you know, because we we currently we currently have these assaults happening from the ground up in groups like the ones you just mentioned, and also to some extent from the top down. I mean, um, in uh, in Scotland earlier this week, in the week we're talking, uh, um, a young man was, was now thirty, uh, but was. Um, uh, was uh, fined and he was charged and uh, sentenced for a, uh, a crime of uh, of causing a offence uh, for what was a joke video, a case of somebody called Count Dankula, which is a YouTube <laughs> name. And, you know, I mean, this guy was totally sort of, I mean, obscure, um, but uh, a joke he made about, about relating to his, his girlfriend's pug dog right. uh, was uh, ended up going to court. You know, and he could have gone to prison. And right. so there are quite a lot of people in very prominent positions, as well as in the sort of thuggish, you know, street sort of movements that are starting to, to, to try to get this stuff in their sights. There are a lot of top down movements as well to basically say, you know, if we're all going to get along, you've got to shut up. Yeah, it's it's not a great time to be a comedian out there. <laughs> <laughs> you could uh yeah you really got to bite your tongue uh yeah i i know the case you're talking about i think the uh the dog um i think he it, it was a heil hitler thing wasn't it uh he he, he i mean it's, it's sort of as always you know the problem with those of us who defend free speech is you you very rarely get to defend free speech on the basis of the Areopagitica or somebody trying to burn the collected works of marcel proust you know <laughs> It, it 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 tends to be uh, like this case, uh, right. and uh, it's always laborious. But yeah, this guy, um, his girlfriend was always going on about how cute her pug dog uh, was, and she left the pug with him, and he thought it'd be amusing to make the pug dog the least cute thing imaginable, i.e., a Nazi, and yeah. taught the pug dog to raise its right paw when he said, like, do you like Hitler? The, you know, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 right. Which, you know, you either like that stuff or you don't like it. You, you laugh or you don't laugh, and that's yeah. the end of it in any sane culture. Yeah. But no, uh, uh, in Scotland, because obviously the constabulary up there had managed to solve every murder, rape, you know, uh, robbery and burglary in the area, obviously they solved all of them. So they moved on to uh, policing the jokes uh, being oh. carried out in on YouTube, and uh, so that this stuff really just has to be countered uh, everywhere you find it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so, and then we will be going down to Auckland, New Zealand, for August 11th, and Sydney, Australia, for August 12th, and we'll be down there with uh, Sam Harris, uh, Brett, and Eric Weinstein, and Majid. Uh, Nawaz. Majid Nawaz, yeah. Yeah, and I think... I can't that, wait for that. Yeah, yeah. I really... Um, uh, did I leave anyone out? No, I think I got every... Oh, and Josh Zepps yeah. will be um, hosting. Um, right. Yeah, I think I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had between you and uh, Majid, because he, uh, he seems to be quite um, n not apologetic uh, for Islam in the sense that, uh, you know, he apologizes apologizes for any violence but um i think i think he believes in a significant amount of utility uh, and 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 there's a and and there's a reason why you know islam should be reformed uh, as opposed to eradicated right uh, i mean uh, i'm not sure he, 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 i've known majid for uh, more than a decade i think now uh, I, I met him first when he, he came out of uh, jail in egypt um mm. And when he when he was a, a, a radical, um, and uh, I mean he is to my mind one of the most hope causing people imaginable. Yeah, no um, kidding, no because kidding. He's shown that people can change, and I've seen it with my own eyes. I mean, uh, eighty years ago in New York, he was on the opposite side of a big debate with um, against m me and uh, my friend Ayan Hersiali, and right. we we debated whether. 
the religion of his upbringing and his religion, Islam, is a religion of peace or not. And Ayan and I were very strongly of the opinion that it is certainly not a religion of peace. Right. And uh, he was trying to argue the opposite. And we had a, it was a classic example of a heated debate actually producing some light because um, a lot of things came from that evening, including a book he did with Sam right. in the end. Um, but a lot of things came from that evening. And it showed, I think, that you, if you, if you have issues out, I mean, I, I've always got a lot of flack for criticizing Islam, but, and everyone who does it does. But, um, you know, if you actually have these things out fearlessly and freely, you can make a hell of a lot of progress. You know, yeah. um, if people stop being terrified, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot you can get done in terms of, you know, pointing to certain obvious absurdities and claims that are made. And you can do it in a respectful way as well, you know. To, yeah. to, I mean, I don't know what Majid's, uh, um, thoughts are about some of this but, but, but I mean I think that at the very least you know um, we have to recognize that 1.6 or whatever it is billion people are not going to suddenly apostatize right um, and so anyone who I mean anyone who does good luck you know um, and but but if, if you if you want to sort of get through some of the troubles that the Islamic world are having at the moment uh you know, putting some hope in reform and really some people really working at reform within that faith is, is you know, if you pardon the joke, I mean, it's the Lord's work. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I've, I've talked to a lot of people on uh, Islam reform and, and on kind of either side of that debate. And, you know, my sense is we do have a limited amount of um, intellectual real estate uh, to devote to these wars of ideas, as Sam uh, Harris puts it. Um, and I I wonder if our time is better spent uh, in the Richard Dawkins uh, fashion of, of firebrand atheism uh, or, uh, you know, right. if, if the results uh, for the reason side are going to increase with that or opposed to going at it and putting a bit of a protective blanket over it like like reformists do and and right. that, that kind of helps to to even slow down the effect that the firebrand uh, you know humanists can have on on those communities well I, I, look I, I mean i've been through a lot of this over the last uh, you know more than well, almost two decades and i've known uh, almost all the people involved at the coal phase um, my own view has always been that you, you probably need what we would call horses for courses. And, um, you know, if someone wants to run full tilt right at the center of the religion and, you know, and just expose the whole thing, then good luck, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If somebody else believes in a kind of syncretic form of Islam catching on or, you know, good luck, Um uh, I think I think that the thing which some people recognise, you alluded to it, and saying you know, it might be too late for some of the longer, longer time span things. You know, like when people sort of say, you know, I think in the next millennium we can probably get Islam to draw in it. I think that, that the, the thing that is not going to work is what basically most uh, Western governments have decided in recent years to do, which is to is to lie about the nature of that religion and hope that the general public don't read. Right. Um, because it's just, it's, we, we, we're past that stage because you, you can't pretend it is things that it isn't because we've all got access to Google these days and we've all got access to the texts and uh, we don't take it on trust when the, Secretary of State or someone tells us something about a religion, we can find out for ourselves. And and I think that this this sort of general Western you know establishment, for want of a better term, political establishment view that you you lie about the nature of the religion and um, hope that everyone believes you is right. just unsustainable. I mean, I don't know if you saw there was a fascinating conversation Sam Harris had with uh, Russell Brand a little while ago. I couldn't <laughs> believe that Sam. <laughs> Managed to keep his temper. I mean, he just always does because he's a nice guy. But it's the psychedelic. I would have, <laughs> I would have, uh, I would have, I just exploded. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, at one point, Russell Rand says, "You know, the way I see it, Islam is, you know, blah blah blah." 
and 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 Sam says, "Have you read the Quran?" Yeah. And Russell Brand says, "I ain't got time to read the Quran." <laughs> You think, well, shut up then. <laughs> yeah. Don't speak. If you don't have time to read, don't speak. Yeah, don't say and, it's a doctrine um, of, uh, of, of peace. And, <laughs> and you know, and, he, he went straight on to say, I ain't read, read the Quran, but, you know, uh, the way I see it, Islam is just blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who do that, actually. You know, look, I don't know the facts, but I reckon X. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of people who do that. And, and let's face it, there's a lot of people for whom... It's just, it's, it's a great hope. I mean, it's like, I think that basically Islam must be like yoga and Buddhism, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I always say, well, good luck. Yeah. Good luck with yeah. that idea. Just uh, all it takes is a quick Google search of, you know, the, the, the top commandments or the top wishes of, of Allah or or teachings of Muhammad, and, and uh, it's quite clear after a very, very brief bit of work put in that um, this is not a uh, religion of uh, peace. Well, you know, it's, it's sometimes a reader sums this up best, that I had a reader who wrote to me recently an email saying, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I've been interested in what you've written over the years, but I know I haven't sort of delved into it recently, but very much myself, but uh, I just, he just, he said, I just read the Quran, full stop. Religion of peace, my art. <laughs> yeah, that's essentially my, my reaction to... Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but also, but I understand the problem and the conundrum beyond that. I mean, this gets into really deep territory because I understand the problem beyond that, which is, 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 it, is it worth saying that? very much you know right and what about all the people who don't know what their religion it says and believe that their god is really kind and that the messenger yeah. was the most perfect man and and suddenly these people come along and go you're so wrong about the nature of the thing which is the most important thing in your yeah. life yeah exactly and it's it, tricky yeah and the further you <laughs> go down the line of apologetics the the harder it is to pin down anything and i mean uh then the whole book becomes metaphor and then you're basically yeah. in the, a new realm of truth um so so i mean you've you've done a lot of uh public criticizing of islam and has that had an effect on your you know do, are you constantly looking over your shoulder do you feel like you're you're being hunted <laughs> ever or what's what's that like no i no. not hunted no. yeah yeah i've had uh i've had a lot of um trouble from it yeah uh which i, I don't get into much detail about and uh but yes i mean particularly in the, the continent i'm from i mean you know a lot of friends are being shot at, yeah. so it's um, it's it's there are easier career paths um, that I would urge. But um, look, as I say, as I said at the very beginning, if you do want to write uh, and speak, and you do it because you have a genuine interest in ideas and in getting the truth, then you know. I mean, what? bigger subjects are there around in our day than these, you know, um, I could devote myself to horticulture, but it doesn't interest me. Right. <laughs> well, some of us, yeah, I, I mean, as far as I can tell, all of us human <laughs> beings are at the mercy of our pleasure drive, and uh, some people um, get a lot of pleasure out of going to the same coffee shop every morning and grabbing the same bagel, having the same coffee, and that's a highly present pleasurable pursuit but you know some people are pleasure junkies and uh <laughs> they don't get the same <laughs> levels of pleasure out of the ordinary things so uh, i meet a lot of people uh of the latter <laughs> <laughs> um so uh yeah no thanks a lot for coming on today um i uh really look forward to you know meeting you in person next week and uh we'll go for dinner before the event and uh it'll be a, a fun time in new york Definitely looking forward to it and looking forward to Dublin and London and uh, Auckland and Sydney. Yeah, it's going to be a, a ton of fun. Uh, there will be some drinks had and uh, and some good food eaten for sure. Well, now you're talking. Uh, I got I got my head shaved and took a picture of that. Uh, I went and got a pedicure because I forgot to bring nail clippers. Uh, 
And, you know, plus it was kind of nice to relax a little bit. I was supposed to have a day off, but uh, it's been email, email, conference call, conference call, email, phone call, just there's big stuff happening. Yeah. Um, what's your, uh, what has the tour life been like so far? Is it kind of what you expected it would be or are you, or, or is it a little more hectic? No, it's been, it's been fine. I've, you know, mostly what I care about is, you know, are, are we reaching with people? Are we building communities? Do we get a chance to, uh, engage? And each of the events has been fine. The only mistakes, uh, there was a mic incident at the first one. And apart from that, all the other mistakes on the, on the events have been me, uh, which is exactly what I expected. Uh, the venues have been really good overall. And mostly though, just getting a bunch of people to come out. I mean, hundreds of people at different events and it's nice to get a chance to stand around and talk when we did the unholy trinity tour of australia i kind of got a dose for what a you know a 20 day right away from home thing would be like and uh i mean sarah's been with me and it's been i mean she makes it silly easy right yeah hey you need to be here you need to be there you need to be here you need to be there and i just do what she tells me and everything works out yeah, exactly. You don't have to think about much, but the uh, but the show and the content of what you're talking about. By the way, I'm speaking with uh, Matt Delahunty. For those of you who cannot recognize his voice, you should be able to by now. Um, yeah, Matt, uh, for those of you that, that don't know, was a former Southern Baptist, fundamentalist Christian for 25 years. Now he's a prominent figure in the promotion of secular humanism. And we're here in Toronto um, because uh, we're Matt's kind of in the middle part or kind of getting close to the end of the Canadian leg of his tour. And tonight um, he is going to be sharing the stage with Dr. Jordan Peterson, the um, clean your room guy. Um, And I I have a question for him later. I I want him to weigh in on... What about my office? Because my office is a literal shit show. And I wonder if that <laughs> falls under the same umbrella. You know, I this is something that you know, I hope to discuss tonight. Not necessarily the, the clean your room thing, because I don't know that I fully understand where this is coming from. And I could certainly see a context in which um, it's not something specific. Because he is so keen on metaphor, it may be along the lines of, you know, pull the stick out of your own eye before you go accusing your brother or clean up your own yard first type thing. And somebody told me that it was, had more to do with, you know, if you're, if you're not sure what to do with your life or direction, because evidently he's, he's giving like life advice, you know, start with cleaning your room. Uh, I'm not going to fault somebody for cleaning their room. My frustration is that a lot of what I've heard from him seems to be in the category uh, of deepities, which is a, a phrase coined by Dan Dennett's daughter that he popularized. And basically, it's a statement that sounds really profound, but to the extent that it's profound, it's actually false, and to the extent that it's true, it's trivial. And, you know, there's there's a number of things like that. I'm, I'm not that familiar with Jordan, so I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, mostly, I'm always looking forward to the questions, but I'm hoping there's some some discussion so that I can get a better understanding because on a few occasions, you know, people send me clips where he's answered a question about, you know, God or morality or Christianity or whatever. And I'm left going, I have no idea what his position actually is. It's, and I'm not sure that he does. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would suspect that most Christians from what I've seen on Jordan would not call him a Christian, and and they wouldn't claim him for their own. Well, I would certainly think that, you know, he was asked at one point whether he, uh, uh, the question about the historicity of Jesus, did Jesus exist as a historical figure? And I think he gave some answer like it would take him, you know, he'd need to investigate that for about three years. And while I certainly can't speak for every Christian or former Christian, uh, that's kind of a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. Because if it's about anything, it's about a confidence that Jesus 
was divine and lived and died and was resurrected uh, to provide salvation for people. And if you remove any, any portion of that, um, I don't know on what grounds you might be able to call yourself a Christian, um, but that's, you know, that's for him to sort out because mm-hmm. I don't get to decide what a true Christian is, at least not anymore. No, I mean, and it seems like everyone has their own version of of what a true Christian is. So even a, a group of people pinning that down and agreeing is... Uh, well, yeah. The First Baptist Church has one thing to say. The Second Baptist Church has another thing to say. The Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church, the Epic- and we're still within just Christianity. Then you broaden out to other religions. Yeah, well, when you were practicing, there must have been points where you disagreed with some things that your your pastor was saying or, or some people uh, connected to you in the religious community? Yeah, certainly when I was younger, I don't know that there was that much of that. It was basically you go and, uh, you know, the, the pastor kind of tells you stuff and he's the one who's spiritually wise, so you just kind of take it. And every now and then, you know, my mom would have ideas that, oh, what they're, what this church is teaching isn't biblical and what this church is teaching isn't biblical. And as I got older, um, I kind of formed my own thoughts on a number of things, but I stayed pretty close to orthodoxy. It, by the time I got to the point where I was having serious objections, I was already on a path out, even though I didn't know it. Yeah, and uh, I mean, there's so many things in in Southern baptism. Did you ever get tied into the talking in tongues, and or were any of your family members ever... Tied in with that, uh, yeah. I, I, so my uncle was a medical missionary, and I think that he spoke in tongues. That's mostly a Pentecostal thing, and right. not really a Southern Baptist thing. Uh, the and it used to be at a time it was more popular to call it the Charismatic churches rather than the Pentecostal churches, and you'd have dancing and pew jumping and speaking in tongues. And it reminds me of a, of a strange story because to me, certainly the Bible talks about the gift of tongues. How that's interpreted is very different, whether it's I'm suddenly able to speak fluent Spanish in order to share the gospel, or if it's speaking in heavenly tongues, and, you know, I'm not going to dig in on that today. But a friend of mine, uh, his best friend was a Pentecostal, and their church in particular would have the 12 and 13-year-olds kind of come up to the front of the church. And to become a church member, you had to demonstrate that you had been filled with the Holy Spirit, which included speaking with tongues. And he leaned over to the preacher, and he's like, I have no idea what to do. And the preacher said, just fake it, we all do. Now, I can't say that the story's true. It could just be a joke. It could be uh, an anecdote that got exaggerated. I find it difficult to believe that a preacher would say that to somebody, although in the heat of the moment, maybe they would. But what I do know is that it's, it's a little bit wrong in the sense that while there are probably loads of people who do fake it, there are other people who are not engaged in intentional deception. Uh, we've, you know, even back to the 19th century, the the book, uh, Extraordinary Popular Delusions in the Madness of Crowds, and you see this in, um, you know, voodoo ritual tribes, and you see this at uh, Peter Popoff uh, events and, and other ministers, you know, they wave their hands and everybody falls over. Not everybody there is faking it. It's much the same way that if you... There's a cool experiment that I I love to cite where they put a bunch of actors in an elevator and they're all facing the back wall instead mm-hmm. of the door. And one person gets in and they face the door like normal. And eventually they get so uncomfortable that they turn around and face the back wall like everybody else. <laughs> People um, are prone to conform to varying degrees. And you can set up 10 chairs in a room and have three actors filling out paperwork and you know you ring a bell and they stand up you ring the bell and they sit down now they're paid actors and then you gradually introduce new people into the room they will fall in line and stand up and sit down and if they don't you remove those people from the room and eventually you can fill all the chairs remove the paid actors and now everybody's standing up or sitting down when the bell goes off and none of them know why it's just what they've always done yeah like planting a virus. <laughs> and so there's aspects of that that I I think, you know, I obviously you can't I can't prove that somebody wasn't actually filled with a supernatural force, but uh, I think the more plausible explanation is that religions play on that type of conformity 
or prey on that type of conformity. And the people who are most susceptible to it are the ones that are engaging in it. Yeah. How, have you ever tried speaking in tongues? Like, it has it, have you ever tried, like, just, I guess, uh, rambling nonsense? And has it, it, did it give you any kind of feeling that these people were describing? Well, some people might say I ramble nonsense all the time. <laughs> um, I, I've never tried to speak in tongues as anything other than, you know, a joke kind of the, the mim- right. mimicry the, yeah. oh, kind of, you know and, and it, it always ends in oh jesus yeah <laughs> and uh but i i don't want to make it sound like i think for some people they don't so much try as it just happens right yeah along with other stuff uh and the how and why behind that is certainly interesting it's interesting from a psychological perspective as well um but I think it's safe to say that there are clearly some people who engage in this uh, in a way that appears to be fakery. And the curious thing for me is that linguists have analyzed people who are supposedly speaking in tongues, and they find no signs of language or grammar. And the people who speak it, speak it are they can't tell you what they said. They can't translate it. Uh, so, and yet these same people will claim that they got a message from God and they can translate that. Mm. But if they babble uh, in tongues, uh, they cannot uh, translate w- what they said. And the excuse is, well, it's a heavenly language. You're not going to find a grammar right, or anything else. Right. So, Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of the, you know, the, the quick um, compilations of, of these people speaking in this way and, and, I mean, it. A lot of people will look at it and, and say, "Wow, that is psychotic," but there there must be immense pleasure being drawn from what they're doing, or they wouldn't be doing it. So, and it and it must be this placebo uh, pleasure that um, that is just something that makes them feel good. Well, on the pleasure front, I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward to me because. I've ex- I've been in churches and experienced what I would have at the time said was the Holy Spirit. You know, it's a, a feeling of elation. You know, they, you, your hair can stand up. You feel, you know, euphoric and, and happy. And, and everybody around you is basically feeling the same way. And they attribute it to the Holy Spirit. So you do too. I, it's not like I ever had any evidence that it was the Holy Spirit. And curiously... When I found my way, or even before I found my way out of religion, I started recognizing that some of those experiences I could have um, from engaging in secular activities. You know, if I went and looked at um, great art or listened to great music or even secular music, there were, you know, certain songs done certain ways by certain artists would give you that same, you know, sense of chills and awe. And that similar experiences, not identical, none of them are identical. I mean, the experience you have uh, from sex or drugs or rock and roll, those are three different experiences that are different, but feel similar in, I guess, quality. Uh, and they are all similar to the euphoria that you that I, that I experience. I can't talk about what other people experience, but I, I don't think I'm incredibly atypical. Right. So I've heard um, Jordan Peterson describe life when people ask him, you know, what is life? He describes it and, and relates it to suffering. Do you do you see life that way in a sense? I, and I'm sure he means it in a as a metaphor, but um, is life just a struggle that we have to find ways to move through it? Are you sure we're talking about Jordan and not Sam Harris? So no, Jordan, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm I know just, Sam, I'm just, it may be something they do agree on. It, it's a, it's kind of a quick jab. It's a very Buddhist idea that, that, um, uh, the Buddhism idea is quite a lot about getting rid of suffering or minimizing suffering. Uh, this notion that life is suffering, I'd be curious to, to really get a good grip on what somebody actually means by that. I know, for example, um, Mother Teresa, if you read like Christopher Hitchens book, The Missionary Position. Uh, which is the perfect title for that. Uh, <laughs> she had almost a fetish 
with respect to suffering, that suffering was was needed and required. Um, it, it reminds me a little about the, of, of the people who would say, oh, well, you can't know what what good is if you don't recognize evil, or you can't know what pleasure is without recognizing pain. I don't know to what extent, I, I hopefully after tonight I'll have a better understanding of Jordan's personal theology, assuming we can get to, you know, get beyond the metaphoric truths, uh, which I don't think are, are, are true. I mean, I understand that you can inspire people um, with poetry. You can in, in, encourage and embolden people with metaphor and uh, allegory and all these things, and that's great. But I also care about what actually is, what is consistent with reality. And there's a statement somebody sent me that he made that was, I don't think reality is made up of matter. I think it's made up of what matters. And if, in fact, he, he said that, uh, that is, I mean, he, there are people who refer to him as the, the Deepak Chopra of Christianity, and, and they're basically slamming on him for saying things that sound incredibly deep and profound when they're not, they're, they're deepities like we discussed before. Right. And so I don't know. Um, I, maybe in the course of the evening, somebody will ask him about this notion of suffering. Because for me, I don't look at life like that at all. Certainly there is suffering as a part of life. Certainly there, there's pleasure and pain. There's happiness and sadness. Yeah, of course. And we make, there's no, as far as I can tell, intrinsic meaning or purpose to life, not like the universe is dictated. This is what life's supposed to be like. There are just the facts of the universe. And I get to give my life whatever meaning and purpose I want. And for me, I want to learn as much as I can about as much as I can. Uh, I'd like to be able to share some of that with other people um, to help people care about skepticism and humanism and if there's something better than either skepticism or humanism to discover that and share that as well because uh, as far as we can tell if there's anything like an afterlife uh, there's a bonus that's a bonus or maybe you know damning but who knows there's nothing I can do about it there's nothing I can do to investigate it so I'm stuck dealing with the life I experience I would like it to be the best life that it can be um, I don't buy into notions that you know that merely surviving is enough i i want to thrive and it's not a simple you know hedonism let me let me run around and you know eat whatever i want and dance and you know drink eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we may die it's more of a eat drink be merry study learn teach share help because you could die any second mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, so it's I, I worry that people view like a, a secular worldview. Oh, it doesn't have meaning and purpose. Yes, it does. Oh, well, you know, you can't be moral. Yeah, you can. Well, you can't have a foundation for moral. Yeah, you can. Ah, oh, well, why isn't your life just joyless? Why don't you, do you experience awe? Yes, all the time. We can build scientific models on all of these things. We can build a model that demonstrates more awe in something compared to the other other thing there based a, on you know the uh, just experimenting it there's a guy in um maybe it was ottawa who spoke to me afterwards because he had gone down for the eclipse and i was in south carolina for the eclipse and unfortunately it clouded up right before the eclipse happened and he was asking me you know what was what was that experience like for me did i experience you know like incredible awe and 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 i said no I didn't, in part because it clouded up, and in part because I'd you know, been watching the footage and seen the pictures, and I don't think there was something that would have been special about the eclipse that would have made, you know, like, really hit me hard. It would have just been, that's, I'm so glad I got to see that, you know, in, in reality instead of just on a video screen, and it's cool. But I told him that recently on my Facebook page, I shared a picture that really, or a video that really did strike me with awe. And it's something that, you know, when we go over to the UK at some point, I'd love to see if, if it's possible to witness it live. And it was a massive flock of starlings uh, doing this dance in the sky, mm, yeah. a cloud of them moving in just a mesmerizing pattern 
right before they all settled down, you know, for the evening. And I bet I've watched that clip four or five times. And that is, a, for me, more of a moment of awe than the eclipse. And I think it has something to do with the fact that I know Dennett has used this particular example in, I believe, Freedom of Alls, and I think Dawkins has used the example of this as well at some point. Those are living things. They're minds. They are acting um, without a any sort of clear leader, like nobody's directing the dance that they do. Uh, we don't understand it. Is this? Uh, it seems to be a wasteful process you know they're they're using up energy you know maybe they need to get rid of the energy maybe they ate too much that day or something but I, I I watch it and I'm just in awe that this clear unguided process can produce something orderly and beautiful and it didn't even occur to me but somebody on my Facebook page commented oh they're just like fish because you see the same sort of schooling mm. and, and yeah. patterning in, in it, some It's fish. so true, yeah. And I, I mean, when I see things like that in nature and, and I start thinking about what is making this happen because it seems illogical, it just makes me think of our pleasure drives driving us towards creating art. And... I, I I mean, we know that animals are controlled by their pleasure drives just as we are. So they must be getting immense pleasure out of what they're doing or they wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, I certainly think that's part of it. I know that the old me would have looked at that through through what Seth Andrews has called his, the God glasses. And it, w- it would have been more of... Oh, isn't God great? He got these starlings to do something wonderful for our entertainment. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and the truth is, for me, the notion that, like, let's say there was a God who just decided, you know what, I'm going to make the starlings do this wonderful dance just so that humans can on occasion see this and, and be in awe of how awesome I am. I think that that massively diminishes the actual value of what's going on. If... You know, there's there's several pictures uh, on the wall here where we're filming. Um, somebody built that building. They took a picture of that building. But if it was, let's say, a, a painting of a flower, that's impressive that somebody can reproduce that. And then you look at an actual flower, and to me, if there was a feel, like the, the, the wildflowers are out in Texas right now, blue bonnets and uh, Indian blankets and all kinds of things. And we were just, we were driving through and it was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing and beautiful. And if I thought that there was a God who put all that together, it would be diminished. It would be, you know, if God can do anything, then certainly instead of just making a flower that can make me go, oh man, that's really pretty. He could, you know, make a flower that, you know, gave me an orgasm and knocked me over. If you, want to, you know, that that's so it's kind of like uh, he, like he phoned it in. You know, you can do anything you want, and I'm going to make a flower. That's what I would plant. Those are the flowers. The I orgasm plant. plants. Yeah. yeah, the poppies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tonight sold out very quickly. So obviously, there's a huge interest in hearing this conversation between yeah. yourself and Jordan and we are uh, creating a video of the event which will be released everyone will get an opportunity to see it and I'm sure it's going to be very popular and, and part of my plan because um, I do three videos a month for my Patreon thing to kind of pay the mortgage and let me keep traveling around meeting people and stuff uh, I know that I get back Tuesday night late Wednesday the 18th is when I try and catch up on all the things that went wrong, like the fact that my credit card got shut off while I was in Canada, and now I've got to activate the new one. But uh, the three videos that I'm planning on doing, one is going to be a retrospective on uh, the Canada tour for Magic and Skepticism to, to talk about meeting people, the questions they had, and things that I think you know, might be helpful to the audience. Uh, the second one is going to be a look back at the conversation with Jordan and my thoughts on you know what happened, or what I guess what's getting ready to happen, but mm-hmm. since I'm talking about the future of the past... 
And the third one is going to be the second in the um, Women in the Bible series. I did one that was about the worth of women in general. And I think we're going to do, uh, Beth, Beth is helping me on this so that I don't screw it all up. Uh, but I think we're going to do like even Lilith yeah. as the next one. The uh, worth of women in the Bible uh, is the answer basically shit in the end. I uh, in some cases it's a half to two thirds of a man when they're actually putting prices on it. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of it came down to uh, you know women aren't often mentioned in the Bible except as somebody's wife, somebody's mistress, um, somebody's handmaid. Uh, or somebody that they need to use as an example for something. And one of the key things is, you know, can they own property? Can they inherit anything? Um, They're certainly not anywhere on an equal footing with men. But it's the little things that people often don't think about. Everything's written from a male perspective. There is passages there of what to do if you suspect your wife of infidelity. There are no passages about what to do if you suspect your husband of infidelity. Right. Certainly there's no passages uh, of, of what to do if you expect you, you suspect your same-sex partner of infidelity. Yeah. But, and when you look at the Bible, I mean, barrenness is the big issue that we kind of address because it was used as a punishment all the time. And not just a punishment for what the woman might have done, but if there's a king who's disruptive, all the women in his kingdom are going to be barren. You know, mm. So everybody else is getting punished for what some dude did, which was funny. It, it, I say funny in the amusing sense, not that it was, uh, you know, actually funny. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks for uh, chatting with me quickly today. Sure. We um, Now it's time to kind of get ready for the event. We're going to go have dinner with uh, Jordan and his wife, I think, is going to join us. Oh, that'd be great. And... Um, Yeah, and then we'll head over to the theater, and I will uh, be bringing Jordan on the podcast.